my Juicy Co-Creators, Lilou here. I'm in Toulouse in the south of beautiful south of France. Isn't it gorgeous? A little bit rainy today? Well, it's a bit cool. I'm a subtropical species. And so for me, it's a bit cool. So I have my hat on. <laughs> You've got your hat on. You call it hair. <laughs> this is Michael. Uh, you might know him already because you wrote 14 books. Is that right? You yeah. travel the world? Actually, yeah. 14 or 15 books. And this is my 21st year of traveling the world. Yeah. Amazing. Um, you, you might hear a British accent, an Australian accent, you're a world citizen, a universal being. I've been in Australia 45 years, so, but they say I sound like English. English sound, say I sound like Australian, and Americans haven't a clue what I sound like. <laughs> but they seem to like it. Wonderful. Well, this is going to be a juicy conversation. That's what it says. What do you hear by juicy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oranges. <laughs> Well, let me tell you, I feel it's, I love people like you that speak from the heart, that want to share passionately their life journey so others can can uh, learn from it. You were, from my understanding, one of the first ones to really create and dynamize the organic movement in 63. You've done your homework. I have, haven't I? Oh my goodness. And, and in 86, you had this main spiritual awakening. So yeah. tell us a little bit about your, your unusual journey and when everything shifted. Well, it depends how far back you want to go, but I immigrated at um, 25 and went to Tasmania, Ireland state of Australia, and I became a regular farmer, but I wasn't very regular, I guess, and um, when I look at it now, I can see that soul and personality were on a journey, and it was a place where soul became the dominant part, and soul sort of whispered, you know, this is not where we need to go. And so, basically, I started... Um, I started having questions on the farm and uh, I would sit out in the fields and get answers. And I applied those answers and they always worked. And then I began to sort of open up in uh, my ideas of, of um, as an adult, as a child, I had a different relationship. But I began to open up in the ideas that nature wasn't quite as fixed and set as it appeared to be. And then eventually I, had, I became an organic farmer. Um, so I, w I was given a little article on growing tomatoes organically mm -hmm. by um, somebody from America, actually Ruth Stout, a um, long time ago. And uh, I, I read that article and did it to my whole garden and realized, hey, the whole farm could be this way. But it's, it was like timing. And um, the timing was that once I'd read that article, everything fell into place and it seemed that I knew how I could do this on the whole farm. And so I applied the principles to the whole farm. And then I had a friend and he and I um, and a few others started an organization, the Organic Gardening and Farming Society in, um, in Australia, which is still going and sort of became a big thing. And I dropped out of that because I had a different journey. I uh, had an experience once where I was um, working on the tractor and up on the foothills of Mount Arthur, which was part of my farm. I was a mountain farmer, or hill farmer, I guess I should say. And uh, I stopped the tractor at, the, at about lunchtime. And when I stopped the tractor, there was silence. And there's never silence in nature. There's always sounds, birds, wind, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I sat there and I had my sandwich and uh, I laid back on the ground. And I realized even my thoughts were slowing down and becoming more silent. And in those days, I was good at thinking. And, uh, and then I saw an eagle. I was laying down an eagle was flying above me, an Australian wedge-tail eagle, and he's spiraling about 100 metres above me, round and round. And I watched that eagle, and I, of course, with natural thought, I go, wow, wouldn't it be something to fly with the eagle? And then there was an inner movement, and I was in the eagles, looking from the eagle's eyes down onto myself, looking up, with my eyes open, looking up. I almost lost it, but I didn't. And so from the eagle's eyes, I saw the whole farm, and uh, then I saw where the cows, my cows had been in the forest, which I didn't know about. And I could see all their tracks where they went in the forest. But then the vision changed. It wasn't just looking through the eyes of an eagle. And one of the things that really caught my attention, incidentally, was that the eagle looked through the eyes of immediacy, this immediate moment. It didn't look through the eyes of the intellect or knowledge or all that, or yesterday's eyes. It looked through the eyes of immediacy. And that really caught me because I realized humanity doesn't do that. We look through yesterday's eyes with yesterday's belief system. And I knew that was something I needed to learn. But as I, that was when the vision changed. And I was looking down at the ground and the great gulf 
was there. And myself and the tractor was one side, and on the other side was all the forest, and I knew that was nature. And there was this gulf of separation between myself and nature, between humanity and nature. And I decided I was going to cross it. And that journey took me the next 15 years and took me away from farming to start a community, a spiritual community, to leave the spiritual community until there came the time, and which was pretty traumatic, of my spiritual awakening, when I, you know, enlightenment, self-realization, whatever. And that was the moment I crossed the gully, the, this gulf of separation. And immediately I realized, I laughed, there isn't a gulf of separation because it's created by the intellect, but you've got to cross it to know it isn't there, and there's no way around that. You have to cross that gulf of separation to be able to, um, to, be able to, to, to journey. So my, the journey then um, really took off into nature on a whole different level, and um, today it's on a, a completely different level even from them. Yeah, yeah, tell us how uh, how it is now and how you define spirituality now, because from my understanding you had created before a spiritual community. So you were, you, it was just an, the next phase of evolution? The, the For me, yes. I mean, I created, and with my late wife, we created a this community. And, but it was for us, it was for us to grow. It was like I created my classroom and I became the chairman of the trust there. And this meant that if anything went wrong, it was my fault. And if anything went right, it was nothing to do with me. And you grow. And then I realized there I didn't like people. I really became aware of that. Then I became aware most people there didn't like me. And so that was pretty mutual. Then the next stage was I realized I didn't like me. And that was a hard one. Mm -hmm. And so there I learned to take off my armor. And my armor, I grew up with very, um, my father's brilliant, my brother's brilliant. So I grew up with articulation, and I grew up with, um, I put on a, on a shield of arrogance and, um, and aggression. And so my um, articulation, arrogance, and aggression kept people away. And I realized that I could keep people out, but if I did that, I kept God out, I kept life out, and I kept me in. And so I decided, you know, I knew that it was time to take that down. And in the process of four years in that community, I took those down. At that stage, we were like a sister community with the Findhorn uh, community in Scotland. And I knew Peter and Eileen Caddy very well. And, um, but that was a phase that I moved beyond. And when I left the community, I had a lot of consolidation to do in my own spiritual growth. And that was when I began this connection with, we can say Pan, or we can say the spirit of nature. I always refer to him as Pan, but it's not a him, and he's not a being, and he's not in it, and there's no masculine or femininity. I just call him Pan. Um, but it's really the conscious intelligence of nature, which is vast. And so I had to, Pan broke down my borders and boundaries of reality. We all have them. We put round us a a barrier, a border of what is real and what isn't. And when you take drugs, which I never have, but sometimes people, when they take drugs, it rips that border away and they go almost insane. I mean, they're completely mentally and emotionally unbalanced after that because you're ripping something away, rather like ripping open the yeah. petals from a rose. Yeah, I just want to pause a second because this is a very good point. A lot of people take psychedelics and even say that this is one of the ways, if not the way, to reach unity. Through drugs? Oh God, no. The only there are some movements and some films about that these days. Look, where, if you take drugs, it's uh, an invasion of your energetic field and it'll put you back further than where you began. So yes, it'll probably give you way out experiences, but every time you come back, you'll be a bit further behind than when you began. And so no matter how far you take that, um, hallucinogenic drugs... Um, I'm not saying they're bad. I'm not even saying they're wrong. What I'm saying is it doesn't work. You know, I have nothing against them. It just doesn't work. I look at life very much these days and times. Does it work? Self-criticism, does it work? No, it's an attack on the heart. And so don't do it. And people continue doing it. And so my, uh, my journey today with the spirit of nature, with Pan, is into a... Is, I learned a long, long time ago that I could leave this physical body. It's not a, I don't have to do it through, um, when I'm asleep, an astral projection, out-of-body experiences. 
and I really don't think most people have to, but there you go. And so I learned... So you can multiply yourself in different dimensions no, and know exactly, not tell quite us... Not like that. I learned that we're a body. You know, the body is mortal, the being in it is immortal. And let's just say that soul has a light body. And it's not confined. So what we have is a belief that we are a body. And I let that belief go a long time ago, so I leave my body. You know, I, and I could leave it sitting here. And um, I can leave it at the computer where I leave about just enough consciousness to keep tapping away, doing what I want to do while I go. So it's definitely an altered state of consciousness. And then once you do that, you'll find you're no longer in a linear world. You're in a greater reality. And the greater reality is where we're born to. I mean, we're metaphysical beings. And a greater reality is metaphysical. Metaphysical precedes the physical. Physical doesn't come first. A tree, you look at that tree. That tree, we see it as physical. But that is the physical reflection from a greater metaphysical reality. That's like a reflection in a mirror. And w what we need to do is, like Lewis Carroll said with Alice, it's, we need to go be the other side of the mirror. We need to go through the mirror. And nobody does. They hug the tree and chant to the tree and sing to the tree and say, lovely tree. But that's, that's the effect. That isn't the cause. That's How do we cross that line? How would you go there? That's, um, yes, yes, that's now. <laughs> that actually is, the path is love. Loving yourself. Your relationship with yourself is your relationship with life. The more you love yourself, the more life, um, the more life shares love back with you. And yet, in a way, you see, you are life. People say, what's the meaning of life? That's the meaning of you. And so when you realize that everything, everything is created from this energy of love, then you realize love is not an emotion. Love is the power of creation. And so when you're loving yourself, you're in resonance and in harmony with um, all the, of nature. But the real thing is, you have to get to the point where you realize that there is nothing outside self. Now, when I say self, I don't mean your physical body. I don't mean your identity. I mean who you are. And who you are has no borders and boundaries. And so you can spread your borders and boundaries out until nature is within self. Mm -hmm. And then you have a relationship with nature. When you can begin that you're, not like, that you're not creating a relationship through separation which doesn't exist, which is an illusion. And so most people's relationship with nature is based through an illusion. And there isn't one. There is no illusion, but there's an illusion until you know there isn't an illusion. So what does it tell you then? Tsunamis are really big uh, events that we feel totally out of control and very shocked at and has disasters actually, and consequences. See, actually, see, um, nothing's out of control. Everything is unfolding perfectly. Let's just say there is a creator called God, which there is. And God is in everything. All is God. Then Either, ha what do we do? Do we say God has lost the plot? Or do we say maybe God has everything in perfect order, in perfect balance? Let's forget order. Let's say perfect balance. And that um, everything is unfolding perfectly. But we look at it through yesterday's eyes and through knowledge and with, with polarity, good, bad, right, wrong, should, shouldn't. But if you were to take a caterpillar, have you ever seen one fly? They don't fly, so they become butterflies. But before that, they become the, they have to go through metamorphosis because they're not built to fly. Well, it's the same with us. So we are now in metamorphosis, which means the cocoon is hardening around us, and inside that, death visits the, that caterpillar. And basically, it destructures. Destructure, interesting word. Destructuring precedes restructuring. Destructuring is often metaphysical. Chaos. Well, if it depends how you use the word chaos. See, I've given that a whole different meaning because in my world of metaphysics, nobody wrote a language for it. So let's look at, let's look at chaos. We're jumping around a bit here, but let's look at it. If you look in your structure of a finger, you notice it stays pretty much the way it should be. It doesn't float away. Because in every cell of that finger, there is a dynamic. And that dynamic is there is an energy which is like a red energy, and maybe there are a thousand shades of red energy. This is, this is difficult to follow. There are maybe a thousand... We're with you. A thousand shades of this red energy, which I call chaos. 
Now that red energy um, has a language and the language is purely emotional. And the, lang the, the emotions of me, when I'm metaphysical, your emotional body is with you. And my emotional body understands and knows the language, which I can't tell you because the intellect knows nothing of it. And so the emotional body, which is unique, our emotional body, I've met many beings and none of them have an emotional body as complex or as beautiful. God, our emotional body is beautiful, as beautiful as ours. And so I feel a vast array of emotions from this red energy, from benign and beautiful to ugly and dark and horrible. But it's all one. This is chaos, which is the engine that drives. Okay, now, so chaos out of order is a wildfire. It's, it's completely out of order. So on the equally balancing that, we have order, which I see as a black energy. You know, and everything you look at metaphysically is there. And the black is also about a thousand shades of black. I mean, how many shades? I couldn't say more than three shades. In fact, I'm not sure I could do that. And so for me, they're all, they don't have names. But again, my emotional body knows the language of this, these black, this black energy, which is order. And order is the, st <coughs> the stability of structure. So one is the engine that drives, the other is the stability of structure. Now between these two, it's like, it's like if you have a rope, and you're twisting one one way, one in one way, and the other in the opposite direction. And then gradually the rope tightens and you create what you call torsion. And that's the proper word, torsion. And that there's a perfect, you could break that rope eventually, but there's a perfect point where the rope is an absolute um, a dynamic of balance and that is a white flickering white light and balance is the place of greatest potential and so to order and chaos are all the time opposing each other but they're not in opposition they're in complete accord with each other and yet they oppose each other this is the paradoxes of truth and so out of that comes but the balance human beings sometimes i metaphysically journey to other cities you know, any time because there's no time and, and no distance you know i can step between and i arrive in new york from australia like one click like that metaphysically wish i could do it physically and so i find the people of balance and the people of balance have a white light flickering around their bodies and they walk a different path from people who are chaotic and people who are over ordered you know, over-ordered is basically, part of that is fear. If you see a stone, that is order with no chaos. And if you see a wildfire, as I said, chaos with no order. The balance is the dynamic of the greatest potential of growth for everything, including human beings. We, point zero? We, point zero, no, well, that's a whole different um, thing, zero point energy. But it's certainly the point of the greatest energy for a human being as we are in three-dimensional reality. Um, you see, every dimension has like a book and it has pages. And so I call those pages frames of reality. And we're on a particular frame of reality in a three-dimensional, in the three-dimensional book of life, which is um, going through probably the first um, dimensional shift that this humanity has ever experienced. Is this, I see that you wear the ring of, uh, is it the infinity sign for you? Infinity. Well, I'm, in inf I'm infinite. And so I, I wear that because it means so much to me. Like, um, you're infinite. We're all infinite beings. We're here. Do you, I mean, God, we're only here on this planet for a little time. And even every lifetime in the hour is like five minutes in the hour. And, but then if you take the hour and put it back into a greater scale, I mean, you know, we're immortal beings. We're, metaphy we're magnificent, metaphysical, multidimensional beings of love and light. Even physics will tell you we're made of light. They just had forgot the equation of love. So when you're living lovingly, and this is what I teach, and mm -hmm. as a spiritual teacher in my intensives, I teach unconditional love. Now, I can't give that to anybody, but I can point the direction it is and say, if you live this way, this is what you find, unconditional love. And it begins with loving yourself unconditionally. That means you can't blame anybody for anything that happened. You never criticize yourself. You never judge yourself. I mean, for over 20 years, I've forgotten what worry and anxiety feel like. I mean, I don't do those. If I get enough sleep, I don't do tired. I don't create fear. Who needs the stuff? 
up to the first 49 years, I did a lot of fear. Now I don't need it, so I don't do that. So when you've got no anxiety, no worries, no fear, you're not judging yourself, you're not criticizing yourself or the world, then it becomes a very peaceful place and you have lots and lots of energy. And um, that's good, good fun. Mm -hmm. It's a nice place. To How old are you? <laughs> this body is 75. Yes, you, and that's what I had read, that you, you are like 50 or not even. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not this body. So the body, I look after it, because it's a beautiful body. I mean, most people don't consider themselves beautiful. I think I'm, I'm knockout, I'm drop-dead gorgeous. <laughs> and so, but beautiful, be you to the full. Yeah. And when you see yourself as beautiful, so I have a lovely relationship with myself. I have a, everybody has an elemental being with them, like the elemental being of your own body, or this conscious intelligence of your own body. So mine's called Max which is short for maximum potential. Mm -hmm. And so we talked to each other, and last night he said, you shouldn't eat quite so much of that particular dessert. And I said, be quiet, Max, and did. And he was right, I shouldn't have done. But generally I listen to Max, and we get on very well. So I look after this body, I work out, and I do um, things. But, but the main thing is, I love the body, I love who I am, it's part of me. And although I'll leave it behind one day, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's good. I figure 150 years, maybe. I mean, half. I'm just I'm just just middle age. You think we can reverse aging, as well, Deepak Chopra? It's look at this. Yes, look at this. I mean, we every all the animals on this planet have a life expectancy of seven times the development of their physical body. So it takes us 20 years to develop our physical body. Seven twenties are 140. Not too many of them around. Why do, we, why do we have a shorter life of all the animals? Because we attack ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if you stop attacking yourself, then your relationship changes. But your relationship with yourself is your relationship with your life. So when you're loving yourself, everything changes. And I can look around the world and see the terrible things that are happening and the horror of what humanity does to itself, blindly and unwittingly, And, and I'm told this is all, they're all suddenly going to wake up and be happy boys and girls. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. You know, we follow our path. We cre we're here to learn the rules of creation, the principles of creation. The only way you do that is if you live the creation you create. In other words, we each create our own life. And this new age th cliche, we each create our own reality, it's been going around for donkey's years. Nobody gets it. They just say these words and then go on blaming other people and blaming themselves. We create our entire life. Mm -hmm. Physically alive, when we're no longer physically alive, the eternity of our lives, we create it. And when you realize that you are a being of love and you create from that place of love, wow, it gets fun. Mm. But you can't then look around and say, you know, that they've got it wrong. They just haven't found the way that works. And to me, there's no right, wrong, good, bad, or any of that stuff. There is simply, there is simply, does it work? And if it works, then that's okay for as long as it continues to work. Mm. Every talk I give, generally, not everyone, but I, ask, I tell the people, let's start off basically knowing that you're all insane. So they smile, like thinking this is a joke. And I say, no, I'm not joking, this is serious. You are insane. And so I, said, I say, I'll prove it. So I say, is there anybody here, put your hands up, if there's anybody here who never criticizes themselves, no hand ever goes up. I say, okay, so you're criticizing yourself. Second question, does it work for you? Put your hand up. Nobody ever puts a hand up. So I said, well, the third question you've answered, have you, have you stopped doing it? And clearly you haven't because you answered the first question. And insanity is a definition of insanity. You know it is to continually do something that you know it doesn't work, expecting better results. Well, they're not going to get better, especially when you're attacking yourself. And if people realize that self-criticism um, goes directly to the heart first, and, you know, 25 days after conception, a group of cells come together and begin to beat, and that's the embryonic heart a hundred thousand times higher in electromagnetic energy than the brain, five thousand times stronger in pure magnetic energy than the brain, electric energy than the brain. And so we have this, we have this incredible heart, which is the physical, 
um, heart and there's a metaphysical heart which is like a virgin space and every time we criticize ourselves we're basically sending in a bolt of negative energy into that heart and um, eventually it has an attack then we call it a heart attack which is just life showing us hey yes you've been attacking it hmm. and when you stop it gets good I don't attack myself there's plenty of other people who can do that I don't need to a lot of people watch these videos on the Juicy Living Tour and all the different interviews. Um, a lot of people, um, and we consider ourselves as spiritual, what would you like to say to the spiritual community? Or what needs to happen as far as you see it? Is there another shift? Uh, there is a certain spiritual ego that can happen at some t sometimes. There is some things that seems out of balance to me. Can you put that in your own words if you feel that? Or every, what you would like to say about this topic? Every um, humanity is completely in... Chaos is rising. Chaos is rising through the planet and right through um, humanity. And basically that's going to probably cause some interesting times. The Earth, the Sun, sorry, has changed um, north and south polarity, which it does quite regularly. The Earth has, is, um, they tell me, it changes every 400,000 years and it's 780,000 since the last time. So we're overdue for a polarity shift. If that was to happen, then the down goes electricity. ACDC becomes um, NG, no good. And so suddenly we're without electricity. That would give everybody an opportunity to see where they're at. You know, they would be, it would be like a reflection of everybody. I mean, the truth is, in many of the cities, there would be large numbers who go practically insane with fear. Everything stops. You know, nothing moves, no transport, no communication, no lights, no heat. Um, hospitals are um, no longer able to operate. Um, everything stops. No sewage going out, no food coming in, no water coming in. It gets quite an interesting scene. And I'm not into, you know, I'm not talking about doom and gloom because... The worst thing that could happen to humanity is that we continue more of the same. If anybody's interested, they can find the statistics. More of the same is killing us. More of the same is throttling our, our natural creativity. We have grown intellectually enormously, but we have not grown in consciousness, not as a, as a whole species. Many of us have chosen to. Many of us have moved with the energy of love and compassion and care for others. But a greater majority have not done that. They've moved with fear and I want and I need and etc. etc. I control. They're two different for for a long time those streams of energy have been connected. And they're now beginning to move apart. They're still connected, but they're moving apart and they're going in different ways. So what I would say to people if you want to make um choose that stream is in every, every moment in your daily life, choose love. One of the problems here is that we're living subconsciously. Humanity is living subconsciously. Why? Intellectually, you can live subconsciously. The intellect will work subconsciously. But um, I'm not sure about these people in the room and what they have to say. But the only way you can use intelligence is consciously. Because intelligence occupies the moment. And you cannot access it out of the moment, which is where the intellect belongs. The intellect can never come into the moment. So in the moment is God, is life, is love, is joy, is peace and freedom. That's where we're meant to live. And, th and there is conscious intelligence. And so to use intelligence, you have to be consciously. You know, a big shock is you cannot love subconsciously. And psychologists say that probably between 93 and 98 percent of the world's population live subconsciously between about around about 95 percent of every day. And none of that means, all that means, none of those people can experience unconditional love. They Which is can, only in the present moment. It's only in the present moment. They can experience a high level of emotion because there are many levels to emotions. They can experience high level of emotion and call it love. But then you would have to say that's purely a human love and it isn't absolute love. It is not divine love. It's not unconditional love. It is not the creation, the power of creative love. And so when you're, every time, let's say, I often recommend people paint a fingernail green because that's the heart color, one. 
on one on each hand. Every time you see it, you just think, ah, yes, I choose love. Put your hand over your heart to empower that harmony. I choose love. Just that moment and go back to forgetting about it. You see it again. I choose love. A hundred, two hundred, five hundred times a day. I choose love. I choose love. Every time you're, it's as though the subconscious is a great lake and every time you choose love, you take a bucket out. And so you weaken the overall energy of your sub, the subconscious dominance of your life. We're always going to have it, but it doesn't have to become the dominant factor of our life. We have an autonomous system. The subconscious runs that. It shouldn't run our whole life, and, but it is doing that. And so when you're being conscious, you can consciously choose love. And every time you do that, you empower yourself toward love. You empower your, the creation of love in your life. And that creation of love in your life will recreate you in its own image. And you see, I mean, we live in a passionless world. Passion and love go together. You know, passion feeds love. Love feeds passion. You remember Steve Irwin, Crocodile Hunter? What they wanted from Steve Irwin was not his cleverness, all the words, and what he knew. There's plenty of people know that. He had passion, and his passion was real. That wasn't contrived for the public. That's how he was. All He lived just down the road from where I live. So I knew of him very well. I didn't know him personally. But Steve Irwin had passion and the world looked at it and said, well, why? Because they don't have any. You know, you, you need one needs a passion for life. I have a garden. I love that garden. I've got a beautiful wife. I mean, every day I tell her, God, you're gorgeous. I love you. Because that's a new day. It's, she never says to me, oh, ho, hum. I've heard that before. I mean, she glows and she tells me all day and every day, I love you. And we mean it. This isn't like just saying, oh, I love you. Right. Yeah, it's, it's love. Sharing and being in love with yourself, with your wife, with life, with, with, with the world around you. And th this world is going through change. We're in the chrysalis. Who wants to be stuck as caterpillars? Caterpillars will certainly choose their direction, and they have an absolute right to be a caterpillar. But I want to be a light being. You know, let's call that the butterfly. And... Every human has the potential to be light, to be light and to lift our energy, our vibration out of this three dimensional, which has served us beautifully, into a four dimensional, which is here and now, but the way you, but is in completely involved in, with having a loving relationship with yourself. And then when the final shift happens into a fifth dimensional, first page, fifth dimensional book. Good place. I have a little question. Um, well, it's a big question too, but uh, one, I know you wrote many books, including one on true prosperity and a lot of people out um, are out in the world, want to live their passion, are afraid to not have the finances, the money. What would you like to, 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 to say about the true prosperity and abundance of life? The reason, the reason the, um, country by country there's increasing poverty, one, it's man-driven. That's a design, and I won't go into that. None of that's by accident. But the second one, people allow it to happen. So we have shops, and in the shops there are beautiful articles that are completely useless. Utterly, totally useless, but they're beautiful. So they create I want, the I want syndrome. The I want syndrome is never satisfied. It's not a good relationship with life. It's basically quite a negative, I want, and that goes hand in hand with I can't afford. I can't afford, are the names, is the name of poverty consciousness. And so we're taught in every city how to look around and go window shopping. Who buys windows? We go window shopping <laughs> and, um, and we go home. I can't afford Oh, I saw all those lovely things. I can't afford it. I saw a beautiful car, a Ferrari with, with uh, 10 engines in it. Uh, well, I love that, but I can't afford it. Who needs a Ferrari? You know, an old car will get you around just as much, especially if it's loved. And so, I mean, if you want a Ferrari, lovely, but you can afford it. And so, instead of looking at what we can't afford, the other thing is, people don't breathe. Mm. People walk around breathing off a quarter of their lungs, exactly. And so, people who do exercises know that they need to breathe. So, every breath we take in, 80% is needed by the brain. 
So when we breathe small and increasingly we're getting Alzheimer's and dementias, increasingly because the brain is continually starved of oxygen, that is a form of poverty. No tax on air. You can have as much as you like. You can take an extra one for those free p people over there. You can breathe deeply. <laughs> and you can breathe out. <sighs> you can have a great time breathing. No cost. Uh, but your body says abundance. Every cell is going, wow, oxygen. Mm -hmm. No more deprivation. You know, I, I've got oxygen. That is the first level of abundance, to be able to breathe. And the second thing is you never think I can't afford Every time you spend any money, you, get this, you, you move into the words and the energy, the feeling, the emotion of plenty more where that comes from. Mm -hmm. And in a way, there is a bank. All money now is digits. It's just numbers. I mean, it's, we, we know it's not real money. Did you know, for instance, that the debt in the world could never be paid off because there is not enough money in circulation? So it's a game we play, a stupid game. And unfortunately, we don't get to write the rules, but we can write the rules. So if everybody thought of all the money in the world as theirs, don't spend it. Just think from that place of abundance. Think from abundance. Act within your means. But think from abundance. Thought and feel the emotion of abundance. Thought and emotion put together of abundance will create abundance. And you'll have more and more to spend because we are the creators of our own reality. And if you're going to create the poverty reality, that's because you listen to everybody else. They can't afford, you can't afford. You talk about what you can't afford and therefore you create what you can't afford. You create, I can't afford. Can we say that that's also linked to the to the opening of the heart as well? The abundance is truly linked to that? Absolutely. You can't feel abundance with a closed heart. You know, I mean... Whew, I could talk five days on this, but there's a lot of closed hearts on this planet, which isn't bad or wrong, but it doesn't work. You know, they don't experience life. They experience an illusion, and they believe that illusion is life. But life is something far more vast. I mean, I, when I'm metaphysically traveling, I see an incredible vastness of life. It's, but it's simple. It just isn't complex. We're the complex ones, you know, Every, I listen to people speak about life and living, and it's all left brain. Mm. It's all left brain churning it over. And some of them get their facts and figures right. I mean, the scientists tell us we live in a unified field of energy. But have any of them ever experienced it? I mean, it's okay for my brain. Oh, yeah, we live in a unified field of energy. What does that mean if you've never experienced it? It's just words. And people quote these words, but that isn't the experience. When you, when you realize that um, every thought you're thinking, every single thought you have is created. They don't turn to ash and sink down. Every thought you have is creating. Your thoughts are either creating more of the same, and there's one human consciousness, one. There's one consciousness on this planet. So every thought you have is either helping to create growth in consciousness or it's supporting stagnation in consciousness. 85% of the world's thoughts are exactly the same as they've been for the last 10 centuries. Words change like computer and things like that, but the direction of those thoughts is the same mediocre, I'm not good enough, I can't afford, I can't do it stuff. But that's, and, and to, people have to learn that doesn't work. And nobody can tell somebody that doesn't work. You can show them the way toward what does work, but you can't, Intellect is a tool, but it is not conscious intelligence. And we were designed to move and operate through conscious intelligence. Conscious intelligence connects with everything it is. So when I'm loving my wife, I'm loving everything. If I look at her, I can't say I love her more than anybody else in humanity. Because it doesn't I think you should her. come here. Come here into the picture with yes, this yes. part. Let's squeeze in. Let's squeeze in. Oh, actually, we squeeze this way. You see, now, Here is a lovely wife. And now you see how beautiful it is. Now, if I see the beauty and, and I love her, I can't, I can't make that exclusive. That's an emotion that does that. When you're really loving unconditionally, you're loving humanity. I don't have to know humanity to love it. I don't have to say what you're doing is bad. I don't love you. I can say what you're doing doesn't work, and that's stupid, but you are a soul. 
and that is what I love. Not about the personality, the identity. Every human being is an, an, an immortal soul. And I, God, I love that. That's why I do what I do. Do you think it wouldn't be easier being at home and sitting listening to everybody talk French all the afternoon and I don't have a clue what they're talking about? I mean, you know, I, I, the garden's a nicer place, but in the end it's about people. Life is about people. And this particular time of transition is probably the most important moment or the most important period we've ever been through. And we each make our choice in the direction we go. We're not going to be hauled to, into the light screaming or kicked into the dark screaming. We choose our way. And the dark, there is no dark. There is no dark. There is no loss. There's no save. There's no better. There's no worse. None of that applies. No retribution. No reward. It's all about where we move in consciousness, um, where we've been moving in consciousness for many millennia. That's the direction we'll continue moving. And um, I think it's beautiful. It's like watching the flight of a butterfly. You never really know where it's going to go. <laughs> and that's lovely. Beautiful. Would you like to say something? Choose love. I agree a thousand percent. Works for us. Yes. <laughs> We're living testimony. Uh -huh. Every time somebody gets angry, don't get angry back. Choose love. Smile at them. Say, have a nice day and walk away. Um, every time if you're ripped off, financially ripped off, don't sue them. Just smile at them and say, I hope this works for you. And, and walk away and leave it. There's no lack. Only if you think, my God, I need that money they ripped off. Then you're in poverty consciousness and then you do need it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you realize there's plenty more where that comes from, we live in a world of abundance, then you have it. And so in every confrontation, in every angry moment, in every moment when you can react, choose love. Just choose love. It changes your life. Choose love, my beautiful co-creators. We send you much love from Toulouse. We send you love. <laughs> Bye.